find the answer kind of thing. So there you go. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, all right, so you have the exam this week, and then I think there's, so there's just one more paper, and I forget when that's due, probably in a couple weeks or so. And then like the second to the last week of class, that last week of April is going to be the final exam, or the final in-class exam, and then you have the final exam as well. So um, what we're going to do today is we're just going to talk a little bit about trade. Trade is one of these areas where it's, it's odd because there's so much agreement amongst economists, and yet there's so much disagreement between economists and everybody else. All right, so first we're going to talk about some, just some basics of trade, talk about some language um, and vocabulary sort of things. Is that not showing that? Ah, the camera is not just. <laughs> um, so just talk about some basics of trade. And then we're going to talk about the benefits of trade, the two main theories dealing with trade being absolute advantage and comparative advantage. And so we're going to go through a brief numerical exercise that highlights the principle of comparative advantage uh, to talk about the benefits of trade. And then we'll talk a little bit about winners and losers from trade. Because actually the business week this week, and I'll see if I can post that article online. I think I can probably do that on on Blackboard. But uh, Business Week, actually, one of their primary articles uh, this week was talking about how, you know, economists always talk about how free trade is good, but they don't talk about the losers. Well, you know, economists talk about the losers as well, right? That it's not good for everybody. Even if on net, freer trade is better for society and causes higher growth rates and everything else, that there are always losers from freer trade. That you don't get away from having losers uh, when, you, when you have free trade. And so they talk about some of the economics that's, that are associated with that. And this is particularly pertinent to today talking about Trump and Sanders. You know, we have the Wisconsin primaries that are going on. And those are probably going to, you know, it's going to be one of the pivotal points in this whole uh, primary season. And you have both Sanders on the left and Trump on the right that are very much anti-free trade <coughs> candidates that are very popular, partially because their populism around this issue of trade. So it's, it's important to talk about the losers uh, from trade as well. Um, so let's talk, and then I think I'm going to try to summarize, maybe talk a little bit about uh, international trade organizations. So the first thing is just let's get down some vocabulary and some basics of, of this whole story about trade. So one thing to note um, is that we talked a couple weeks ago about this issue of world poverty and about economic growth and you know, certain countries, you know, people only live on $2 a day and all of this. If you look at the last 30 years, there have been huge strides in terms of the income distribution of the world. Like there are many fewer poor people in the world today than there were 30, 40 years ago. And what's interesting about this is it wasn't because of foreign aid. It wasn't because of the UN Millennium Development Goals or any of these sorts of things. It was largely because of two countries opening themselves up to trade and then expanding their economies really dramatically due to that. India and China, given the fact that they're such large countries in terms of population, when they started growing, it actually shifted the distribution of income in the entire world fairly significantly. So trade does matter, and as a matter of fact, it's the best policy in terms of economic growth and decrease in poverty than anything else. So let's talk a little bit about just some vocabulary, just so you don't get these things mixed up. <coughs> Exports are just goods that are sold to foreigners. Imports, goods bought from foreign countries. We have the trade balance, which is just equal to our exports minus our imports. And then we have the trade deficit, which is just the opposite of trade balance. So in other words, it would be your imports 
minus your exports. So here's a question. Is it better to run a trade deficit or what the opposite of this would be would actually be a trade surplus? Is it good for your exports to be greater than your imports or is it better for your imports to be greater than your exports? In? Imports are coming in, exports are going out. Yeah, so the imports would be greater. Just depends on how much cheaper the imports. Whichever the tax is greater. Whichever the tax is greater. Oh, so you think because we can tax the imports? Yeah, that that would be... because it, isn't that right? You tax whatever's coming in as well as what's ever coming out? Well, this is actually, um, at one point in time, you know, you could definitely see that. You know, I'm... I'm Listen to the biography uh, of Hamilton by Chernov right now, and uh, it's it's really interesting because you know our tax revenue in the early days of the republic it, it was imports. That's all we could tax, right? There's no income tax, there's no sales tax. All we could really do is we could control ports, and if you see stuff coming off a ship, then you can tax it. And that's about it. That's the only way you can get money. However. Um, Nowadays, when people, when Trump says, you know, China's killing us, they think we're a bunch of dummies, it's because we're importing so much more than we're exporting to, importing from them compared to what we're exporting to them. And in general, people <coughs> see trade deficits as being bad. Um, my first job actually teaching economics was at the community college I was teaching as an adjunct. And it was funny though, because I had this professor that was there that she'd been there for 40 years. And she said, you know, it's funny how many people talk about how terrible the trade deficit is and blah, blah. I wrote my, my master's thesis actually about how bad the trade surplus was. Because she was doing this in the 1950s when we were producing a lot of stuff and selling it all abroad. And we weren't buying a lot of stuff from other countries. And people would say, you know, it's terrible. We make all this great stuff and we don't get to eat, consume it ourselves. Other people get to enjoy our refrigerators and our, and our cars and all these other things. We don't have a high enough standard of living. Everybody else gets to enjoy our good products. It's an argument, yeah. right? And so the argument now is, well, this is bad because we don't make stuff. Well, we get to consume all this cool stuff, though, right? I mean, that's one way of thinking about it. You know, why do we have such high trade deficits? Well, because... We find it better use of our resources to let the Chinese build our trash cans that are made by Rubbermaid now rather than making them in Detroit, right? Or making them in Dayton, Ohio or somewhere else. It makes more sense for us to get them for, you know, 250 rather than 350 So we let the Chinese make it and we still get a trash can. We just get it for less. Because it's America. <laughs> the problem is, is that, as we're going to see when we talk about winners and losers, that there are people that are hurt by free trade. But if you think about it in terms of, wait a second, yeah, we get all this cool stuff for cheap. That sounds like a pretty good deal. You know? But there are winners and losers. And that's going to be the key lesson today, is that on general, comparative advantage is going to tell us that trade on average is good for countries. Freer trade is better, but there is a distribution of the effects where some people are hurt and some people are helped. And oftentimes, the people that are hurt, it's much more obvious than the people that are helped. And for that reason, the politics of trade often lean towards protectionism and decreasing our trade deficit, even though there's a very good economic argument to say, you know, we should have no trade restrictions, even if other countries don't remove their trade restrictions. We should just get rid of our tariffs, let everything come in for free, because that's going to help our economy more, even if other countries don't. But that's generally not the way things are done. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of comparative advantage versus absolute advantage. So these are two of the key terms when people talk about the effects of trade and whether or not it's good for a country to have more free trade or less. Absolute advantage just means that you can produce a good at a lower resource cost 
than another country. So it's cheaper to produce it in one country compared to another country. That would imply that there's an absolute advantage in producing that good in that country. So the way to think about this might be, you know, we were having our conversation about um, agricultural policies the other day, that corn, you know, is really easy to grow here. We can produce it really, really cheap, right? So there are very few countries, like Mexico even, where they could produce it for less per, you know, bushel of corn or however we want to measure our corn, you know, then we can. It's, we produce at a very low resource cost, so we have an absolute advantage in, hey guys, uh, we have an absolute advantage in producing corn in the United States. Comparative advantage means that you can produce it at a lower opportunity cost. than another country. So now we often don't think about production in terms of opportunity costs, right? We don't think about it in terms of like what we're producing as a country uh, compared to Mexico in terms of what we give up. But really, this is the more important factor than this. And the reason is, is that when we spend a lot of resources to produce things that we're relatively bad at, then we give up the production of things that we're relatively better at. So even if things are, have a higher or lower resource cost, the more, more important thing is what is the opportunity cost? What are we giving up when we dedicate our resources to producing something like that? And the basic difference between an absolute advantage and compared to advantage, you can think about this within production in the household. So um, I have kids. They're getting older now. Uh, it used to be that uh, they used to definitely be worse than me at every chore in the house, right? Every single thing. Every single thing my kids could do, they could do it worse. They, they couldn't do it as well as me, right? So, you know, if we're talking about putting away the dishes, cleaning their bathroom, um, you know, clean, picking up the room, vacuuming the floors, dusting, mowing the lawn, balancing the checkbook, doing the household finances, everything I was better at than they were, right? So I have an absolute advantage in every single thing, right? However. Does that mean that I should do all those things because they're that bad at it? No. No. Because if I do all those things, what am I giving up? Everything. Well, I'm giving up my time, right. And I actually, you know, as an economist, I often get consulting jobs where I can charge somewhere between $250 and $500 an hour, right? So every hour that I spend cleaning a kid's bathroom, I'm going to give up $250, let's say. Is it worth $250 of my time to clean their bathroom? No. And as a matter of fact, it makes more sense for me to do give my son that job. And he can, may spend three hours doing it, and I'll spend 20 minutes. But still, that 20 minutes of my time is worth a lot more than three hours of his time. And so I have a comparative advantage, maybe in balancing the checkbooks, because he really sucks at balancing the checkbook. But he's better at mowing the lawn and cleaning his bathroom now in terms of comparative advantage, even if I have an absolute advantage. The same analogy applies to countries. Just because one country may be better in terms of they can produce it at a lower cost than some other country, doesn't mean that they should, because they're using resources that they could be doing something better with. And that's the basic analogy that we use throughout this study of, of trade and the gains from trade. Right? Questions about this? All right, so that's the basic difference between absolute advantage and comparative advantage. So when people say, well, that other country, they're better than us, or they have cheaper labor or something like that, you know, don't pay attention to those stories. Pay attention to, well, what is it that we're giving up if we decide that we want to produce this good that they can do for cheaper? So here's my example that I'm going to use. So let's say, say we have two countries. We have Mexico and the U.S. And we have two goods, we have genes and computers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the production possibilities.
where we know that the U.S. can produce with all of their labor and capital and, uh, and land, that they can produce at a maximum amount, they could produce 12 computers and zero uh, genes if they decided to produce on that extreme, or if they only produce genes, they're going to end up producing only Let's see. Six, sorry, they're going to do, if they do zero computers, then they can do eight genes and anything in between. So, for example, for the U.S., a combination of four pairs of genes and six computers would be a possibility because they end up giving up for every. Uh, computer that they give up, they get two-thirds of a pair of genes. You guys see that? All right. So that's their trade-off. And we'll do this graphically in just a minute. Well, Mexico, they can produce six computers and zero genes, or zero computers and 12 genes. <coughs> or anything in between. So for Mexico, what is the opportunity cost of producing a computer? How many pairs of genes do they have to give up for each computer that they decide to produce? So if they, give, if they produce one, uh, let's think about it this way. If they start off here with 12 genes and no computers, but then they decide to shift their resource to where they can produce just one computer, how many genes do they have to give up? Okay. Well, if they give up all 12, they get six computers. So it's trading off 12 for six. So if they just trade off for one, they have to give up two. So for every two pairs of genes that they give up, they get one computer. Because in the extreme, if you give up all 12 of your genes, if you go from 12 to 0, then you get 6. So if you just give up 2, one-sixth of that, then you get 1. I'm lost. Okay, tell me more. Okay, like, if you're giving up the computers... No, 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 no. So I'm starting at 12 genes and no computers. So I'm starting here. Okay. Then all together you have 12 genes. Okay, now let's say I'd want to shift and I want to produce nothing but computers. How many computers can I get? And then once you divide, oh, uh, divide, okay, six divided by 12 equals 10. I got it. Got it? All right. So if, if you start off with, uh, at this point, and if you want to shift all the way over, you get six. So for every two genes you give up, you get one. Right. So it's that ratio. You guys see that too? Uh, okay. I got you. And so likewise, when you give up computers over here, you, if you give up 12, you get 8. So for every one computer you give up, you get two-thirds of a pair of genes. All right. All right. So now we're in this world of production possibilities. It takes us back to chapter 1, right? Remember all that stuff? This is the tool that we're going to use to try to tell the story about comparative advantage. All right. Now let's go ahead and draw this. Draw these different production possibility curves. And I'll end up with <laughs> genes on my y-axis now I have computers on my x. And I'm going to, instead of having one production possibility curve, I'm going to have two. So remember, for the U.S., they could produce 12 computers and zero genes, or eight genes and zero computers, or any intermediate combination. So that line right there represents the production possibilities curve for the U.S.
Questions about that? So I'm just translating those numbers that we had um, on the previous uh, page before I raised it to a, to a graph. Right, so it's 8, 0, and 0, 12 as our, <coughs> as our coordinates here, or 0, Okay, so for Mexico, remember, they could produce six computers if they produce no uh, genes, or 12 genes if they produce no computers. So likewise, we can draw this as the Mexico. So this is the production possibilities for Mex Mexico. You see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's just say that the U.S. starts, or let's start with Mexico since I'm holding the blue marker. Mexico starts producing three computers and six genes. That's their initial point of production before they start trade. So initial production, <coughs> so this is production before trade. Production before trade is Mexico is producing three computers and six genes. So is that a point on their PPF? Yep, that's going to be right up here. And we know that they can produce that much, right? So this is where they start off. We'll just label that as point A. So Mexico starts off producing this intermediate combination of computers and genes based upon what they like, right? How much they're willing to pay. They can't trade, so they have to eat everything that they make. They have to make everything that they eat, so that's where they start off. And let's say that the U.S., that their production before trade is also this kind of intermediate point. So for the U.S., it's six computers and four genes. So it's going to be six over here and four over here, and that's going to be D. So that's where the U.S. starts off. So just looking at this, who does it seem like is better off to begin with? Well, Mexico has more genes, but they have fewer computers. The U.S. has more computers and fewer genes, so it's a little bit hard to tell. We have more kind of total stuff if everything's equal, right? But it's hard to tell, right? They have more genes, we have more computers. It all depends upon what people like. Now, this is before trade. We have to consume only somewhere along the production possibilities curve. They have to consume somewhere along their production possibilities curve as well. Now, what's true, however, with trade? Let's just take an extreme example. If we open up to trade, we have a lower opportunity cost in producing which of the two goods, computers or genes? Computers. Computers, because we only give up two-thirds of a pair of genes when we produce an additional computer, while they give up two pairs of genes when they produce an additional computer. So if they went from 12 genes and no computers to six computers and no genes, they have to give up two pairs of genes for every computer that they produce. But when we go from our extreme of eight genes and no computers to producing 12 computers and no genes, we only give up two-thirds. So we have a lower opportunity cost. We have a comparative advantage in producing computers. So opportunity cost for U.S. is two-thirds genes per computer. Opportunity cost for Mexico is two genes per computer. That implies that the U.S. has comparative advantage in computers. All right. Basically, whatever you have the lower opportunity cost in, that's what you have comparative advantage in. Now, the thing that's really nice and easy about this is once you figure out one, you figured out the other one already. Because we only have two goods and we have two countries. So what ends up happening is because these things are reciprocal to one another, you end up automatically figuring out, oh, well, if U.S. has the comparative advantage in com producing computers, it must be the fact that Mexico has the comparative advantage in producing genes. Now, let's think about this. If the U.S. starts off at producing um, 
nothing but computers. And it has to give up those computers to produce genes. How many computers does it give up for each pair of genes it produces? It gives up 12 to get 8, or it gives up 12 over 8 for each one, or three halves, or one and a half computer for each pair of genes it produces. What? Okay, so again, remember what we did before. Let's start off over here, 12 and 0. So the U.S. is producing 12 computers and no genes, right? If we gave up all of our computers, how many genes do we get? We get eight, right? So that's where we end up. How'd you get eight? Because that's what we started off with. That's what we were defined. We already defined that as our production possibilities. I don't get it. You brought in numbers. My mind went blank. <laughs> <laughs> but you got this before. You did it on the other ones. The exact same thing. So we had 12. This is just what I gave you already, which is that we can produce 12 and zero, or zero and eight. And if we give up all 12 of our computers, we get eight genes, which means that for each pair of genes we produce, we give up one and a half computers. Because we go over by one and a half for every time we go up one. Mexico, however, how much do they give up in terms of genes every time that they produce, and how much do they give up in terms of computers every time they get a pair of genes? Well, they only give up half of a computer because they can go from six to 12. So they give up half of a computer every time they produce a gene pair of genes, so they have a lower opportunity cost than the U.S. So U.S. has comparative advantage in computers, which must mean that Mexico has a comparative advantage in genes. The only other good that we have out there. If U.S. has the comparative advantage in one, Mexico has to have the comparative advantage in the other. It's just the way it works because these things are reciprocals of one another, right? It's all just fractions, and if, if we have the comparative advantage in one, they have the comparative advantage in the other. Okay, now, I'm not going to ask you to do all these machinations, right, to, to solve this stuff. I just want you to oh see these God. principles. Okay. <laughs> I just want to. I promised myself that if I got out of college algebra, I would never add, subtract, or multiply again. People ask me, what's 2 plus 2? Negative 16 for all I care. I'm not doing it. You will not be my financial advisor at all. That's no. all I'm saying. Okay. No. It's okay. Not everyone needs to be the, in the count. Okay, so let's think about this. If we open up to trade, this is what happens before trade. If we open up to trade, what does it make sense for us to produce? Well, it's whatever you have compared to the So the next step is when you open up to trade, the U.S. should then produce nothing but computers. So this is where we should produce after trade. Likewise, Mexico should produce up here after trade. Nothing but genes. <coughs> now think about it. If they produce nothing but genes, we produce nothing but computers, and we trade one pair of genes for one, uh, one, for one computer, we can both consume anywhere along that new trade production possibilities curve, or really consumption possibilities curve, which is that both of us have the possibility of consuming six computers and six pairs of genes because we produce computers and we sell half of those to Mexico for six pairs of genes. So how much do we get? Well, we have six pairs of genes, we have six computers, we get to consume there. Mexico, is like, well, Mexico likewise, started off with 12 pairs of genes, they get six computers for those, so they can consume right there as well. So now, what's happened to our ability to consume because of trade? Increase. It's increased. We can now consume beyond what we could have consumed before. Remember back in chapter one, the only way we could get beyond our production possibilities curve was to grow our economy somehow. Trade allows you to consume more than you could even without economic growth. So it allows you to consume beyond your own production limitations. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is true for every country. Regardless of how bad you are at anything, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, think about the example of my son when he was five years old. He could suck at every single chore, but our entire household would be more productive if he did some things and I did other things. Just because otherwise I'm wasting my resources spending time cleaning his bathroom. Right? He could at least pick up his toys. Yeah. Nothing else, kids can pick up their crap, right? And still, you know, there's, they're lowered to the ground. It's a lot easier for them to do it. 
you know, it's still. So the way to think about comparative advantage, it's one of the most misunderstood um, concepts in economics. The way to think about this is it's not what you're good at. You don't have to be good at anything. You can suck at everything. It's what you're least bad at. So whatever you're least bad at, you have comparative advantage in that. And that, any country, I don't care if we're talking about Burundi, if we're talking about you know, Suriname, if we're talking about El Salvador right after a civil war, every country could produce something and then they're least bad at whatever that thing is, that's what they should be focusing on. And that's the lesson of comparative advantage. And if countries do that, they can all consume beyond their production possibilities curve. That's the lesson. All right, questions about that? Not going to make you replicate the math. I want to show this to you, understand the lessons, understand where this comes from. It's all about focusing on what you have the lowest opportunity cost for. And opportunity cost is, you know, basically, you know, how much do you have to give up to produce things? Lower opportunity cost, that's what you're least bad at. Questions, comments? No? Stun silence because you think economics is awesome? Yes. All right. Moving on. <laughs> So this is using our production possibilities curve. Remember, that's our first model from uh, this book. The other model that we use, why is blue not erasing? Blue usually erases. Um, the other model that we use is supply and demand. So now let's use the supply and demand model to talk about winners and losers from trade. So the interesting thing about computers is, of course, you know, back in the day when people used to actually crack open their computers a lot more. Have you guys ever cracked open your computer and actually like taken a part? Of, you know, like desktops is really easy to do at one point. And I, you know, like as soon as I started getting laptops, I just got very squirrely about doing that. It just seemed like it was much more dangerous to do that. But I've, I've taken part of a couple laptops. Um, but you know, back in the day, I used to you know kind of build and play around and you know change out different pieces of my. Uh, my computers, and the funny thing is, like, you'd buy a Dell computer, right? And you're saying, oh, this is, you know, I lived in Austin, Texas. It's made there in Austin, Texas, blah, blah, blah. You crack that sucker open, you notice that every little piece of that is made somewhere else, right? It's, you know, it's some, uh, you know, WD um, hard drive. It's, you know, some, you know, the processor's coming from one place, and the memory board's coming from something else. So everything is made somewhere else. So... At one point, there's this question about where should our semiconductors be made because we had some companies in the U.S., AMD and uh, Intel, that were producing semiconductors. But also you had lots of you know, microprocessors and semiconductors that were being produced all over the world, and, and there's this question about whether or not there's free trade in that. So let's think about this in terms of demand and supply for this one particular good. It's one component of computers. Well, if we think about supply domestic and demand domestic, and if there isn't any trade, then we would have P star and Q star as our price and quantity that came about, right? This is our basic supply and demand model, and we can think about it in terms of just, you know, if we only have domestic supply, only have domestic demand, this is what the market looks like. Now, if we open up the trade, though, one way to think about this is that we are in a world where it's so small that we just observe the, uh, the world price and the fact that some company gets to sell to us doesn't really affect its overall price. So there's a world price for whatever this good this is. And this is what normally happens, which is just because all of a sudden you're selling to a new market, that doesn't have any effect on the price. The price doesn't go up, the price doesn't go down, just because you're able to sell to a new market. In that case, 
the world price, if it's somewhere below the domestic price, then that's going to have very specific distributional effects on U.S. consumers and U.S. producers. So first, let's think about what happens to the new equilibrium. So we had this quantity here that was being produced and this price here. Now, if we open up to trade and the rest of the world produces this good at a lower price, and this is going to happen with sugar, right? So what's the story with sugar right now? How much do we pay for sugar compared to the rest of the world? A lot. Something like two and a half times as much as we should, right? And why is that? We don't let anybody import sugar. We, we protect our markets specifically with the Cuban embargo, but also we have all these price supports and other, other things to, to, uh, to encourage local production that's really expensive, right? It'd be much easier for other countries to produce sugar and for us to import it, but especially, uh, especially Cuba. And, and we put all sorts of restrictions on it. So right now, we're paying a lot more for sugar than we should. If we just got rid of those trade restrictions, we'd face a lower world price. Okay. Same is true with semiconductors back in the 1990s when, when I was thinking about this example for the first time. So what ends up happening? Lower price is good for whom? Who's gonna, who is this going to help out? Consumer. Consumers. right? So think about the demand curve. Before you're consuming up here, now After freeing up to trade, we're going to consume not Q-star, but Q-T. And who's going to get to consume it? Well, all these people over here. Now, one of the things we talked about when we were talking about efficiency as well is this idea of um, consumer surplus or additional surplus from trade. Think about these consumers over here. They're willing to pay this much. Let's say, you know, uh, this is like $20, and they only had to pay 10 before. However, now, if you open up trade, they get even more of a benefit because they're paying a lower price. So it's one of those things where now, even if I was in the market before, I'm getting a lower price. That makes me happy. But in addition to that, you have all these people that weren't willing to pay any price higher or, or uh, that their lowest possible price that they could get the good at was P star. But now when the price is lower, they're able to consume the good, so they come into the market too. So you get all sorts of consumer benefits. You get consumers that are now paying lower prices, and you get new consumers that weren't buying the good before. But who's hurt by this? Producers. These domestic producers over here end up losing out. Because now we have this Q1, and these guys are still... Q1 is... Quantity supplied by domestic producers. But QT minus Q1, those are our imports. And you now have foreign producers that are coming in and supplanting all that domestic production. So this much is lost out by domestic producers. So if you're a sugar beet farmer in Louisiana, or a sugar cane farmer in Louisiana, or a sugar beet farmer up in Pennsylvania, guess what? You hate this idea. You hate this idea of opening up to trade because now there's going to be less, you're going to be able to sell less because guess what? People are going to be wanting to buy the cheaper imports instead of buying your higher cost production. Nicholas? So Q star minus Q1 is a producer loss? It is producer loss in terms of quantity. If you want to think about it in terms of, uh, of producer surplus, that would be, It'd be, uh, it'd be this triangle right over here. Yeah. yeah. I think we did that in 336. Yeah, I was going to say, you've probably have seen this in 336. This entire area was your producer surplus, yeah. and now you're going to end up losing that, and you're only going to be getting, and you're also going to lose that because of lower prices. So this is the quantity effect, this is the price effect, and you're going to be left with only that area for producing surplus. I just forced myself to remember, like, this was A, B, C, and D. I'm just <laughs> subtract the 
you know, when it said producer surplus, subtract this from this. Yeah. I, I like to think about it as Q star. So now, it's one thing if you just think about now we're getting less of our quantity from domestic producers. But who is really hurt by this? Who is hurt when we opened up to free trade in the 1980s and 1990s and the 2000s? What, you know, who is really hurt? Well, the country overall, you know, like we showed before, the country overall, we get to consume stuff cheaper. We get to focus more on what we're, what we're relatively better at. But who, you know, we say producers, but who is really hurt? Who, do, who are these producers that we care about? People who work for them. The people that actually work for the sugar farmers or the people that work for the manufacturers that have been shut down, right? So it's not the fact that we care about, oh, new old Rubbermaid doesn't make our trash cans anymore. It's that people worked at those factories and now they're unemployed and now we have to do something with those workers. They have to get retrained. <coughs> they have to, we have, you know, they have to take unemployment benefits, whatever it is, that they're now going to be in a vulnerable position economically. And did we see that definitely in the 19, you know, 80s, 90s, and 2000s because of changes in our trade balance? Yeah. I mean, when Walmart is pushing companies, you have to lower your price every single year if you want our contract. Those companies are going to say, well, we can't afford to produce domestically. We have to buy the stuff from China now. They're going to shut down their domestic factories, buy their stuff from China. We may get cheaper goods because we shop in Walmart. I know I do. But at the same time, there are people that are losing their jobs. Now, on net, society still benefits because the thing is that for every single job loss, there are millions of people that benefit just a little bit. So if you add up all those little bits across the millions of people that benefit, then you end up with a really big number. And that one person that was lost at a job, they may have only been earning fifty or $60,000 a year. So back in the 1990s, they did an analysis. We had this thing called the multi-fiber agreement, which restricted textiles, like so clothing that came into the United States. We had a very, you know, very protectionist regime in terms of protecting uh, our, our domestic textile manufacturers. And what they realized is that for every single job saved, it cost the United States over a quarter of a million dollars for every job saved per year. Were those workers getting a quarter of a million dollars? No, they might have been getting 50, 60, even $70,000 a year. But there's a huge loss to tons of people. But what was that loss from? What happens if we don't have, if we have to buy our trash cans and they're all made in America? What ends up happening? How much does that affect you? What if all your t-shirts had to be made in the United States? <coughs> How much would that, that affect you? It'd be pretty expensive for you. It'd be expensive, but how much would it affect your the actual price of a shirt? Right, so like you go, you know, you go and you buy a t-shirt at the Gap or something for, you know, or Old Navy for like, you know, 20 bucks. Maybe it's gonna cost $22 now. You buy 10 shirts a year, that's gonna cost you $20 a year. Is that a negative impact on the economy? Yeah, it costs, 20, costs you more than it should. But it's not something you're going to march on Washington about, right? You're not going to say, I need $2 cheaper t-shirts every time I go to Old Navy, right? It's not something that people care all that much about because it's a very small portion of their overall budget. But in terms of this total loss to society, it's huge because you add up all over all those people. But who is going to complain about this? That one person that loses their job, do they have an incentive to complain, to write their congressman, to protest, to make phone calls? Yeah, they have a big incentive because that's their job. So you hear a lot more about the losses from trade than you hear from the gains because the gains are widely distributed in very small amounts to lots of different people, while the, the losses to free trade are concentrated amongst a very small portion of people, but it's heavily concentrated in it. And for that reason, because the gains are dispersed and the losses are concentrated, you hear more about the losses from trade than you hear about the gains. So it's a political reason, not an economic reason, why people go against free trade. But again, that's not to say there won't be losses. There will be losses, and they'll be severe. When those people lose their jobs, you know, you, you know what is, I don't know if you guys paid attention to the story, but there, there was a report that came out in November or so that said for the first time in the U.S. history since they've been tracking this, that white male men in the United States between the ages of 45 and 64 have had a, seen a decrease in their life expectancy over the past 10, 15 years. For the first time, people are living shorter lives in this one demographic group. 
who's going to be losing out to, to, to trade? <coughs> it's largely, you know, especially think about in the Midwest, white, uh, white middle-aged men. And when I know, like, my neighbor is 50 years old. He lost his job during the last recession. He hasn't had a job since, right? It's been six years now. It's hard to retrain people, and that's a very concentrated loss. And I'm not saying he lost it because of trade, but the fact is that he lost his job, and he hasn't gotten a job since then. And if you think about these trade-associated losses, it's the same sort of thing. All right. That's all I've got. You guys have questions? Nope, that's it. Um, it's one of the tests. Yes. Test is Thursday. Uh, test is going to be opened up sometime tomorrow, but it's... Tomorrow. But it will be available Thursday and Friday as well. Oh, okay. So the end date is Friday? The end date is going to be Friday. Yeah. So I'll open it up sometime tomorrow. Um, you know, I'm hoping by about noon or so. And then it will be due, you know, 5 p.m. on Friday. Quiz tomorrow. Right. Uh, there's a quiz that's posted now that you have to get in by tomorrow night. So, yeah. Right. Other questions? Yeah. All right. Have a good one, guys. Papers now.